a four-time All-Star. He won a World Series in 1987 with the Minnesota Twins. At the time of his retirement, he was the all-time leader in saves. Jeff Reardon, how are you doing, Jeff? Good, how are you? Good. Jeff, how are you not in the Hall of Fame? I'm looking at these numbers. I'm going, this guy should be in the Hall of Fame. He's one of the best relief pitchers of all time, and he was better than Lee Smith, and Smith is in, and he's not. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I wish I was in. Uh, you know, I feel I deserve at least a shot, you know. And uh, my first year, I missed my one vote just to stay on the ballot, which I thought was uh, like the biggest joke I ever heard. But, you know, nothing I can do. Jeff, I mean, with the Expos, you had some great players on those teams back in the early 80s. Gary Carter, Dawson, you, Tim Wallach. I mean... Those Expo teams always gave my Cubs fits. Why were you guys so successful? Was it the farm system or was it the managing? I think it was the farm system there, you know, because all those guys actually came up with the uh, Expos. I came from the Mets in 81, but, you know, we were supposed to be the team of the 80s. And you know, I think when the Dodgers beat us in that fifth game in 81, that sort of got us down. And I think maybe if we had gotten to the series that year against the Yankees, you know, we might have been that team of the 80s, but, you know, it just didn't work out. We did well, but we never really got to the playoffs again. Jeff, Chuck Feeney here. Uh, was it a hard transition uh, coming in as a starter? I mean, you were in college, you started a lot of games. We looked up in, in Amherst. Was it a hard transition to become a reliever, and especially a uh, short, short stint reliever? Uh, I didn't really want to do it, but Joe Torrey was the major league manager, and you know back then they had uh, the instruction league. I don't even know if they still have it. They invite like what they consider the top prospects, and I had two years of starting in the minors, and my record was like twenty-seven and seven. And they called me in and told me they're going to make me a reliever, and Torrey was the one that told me, and I was like, "Why? Why would you want to do that with my record?" And he said, "Because it's your quickest way to the big leagues." Because they did have Craig Swan, Pat Zachary, you know, even though they were a last place team, I guess they were pretty good starters. And, you know, once I got the chance to pitch every day, it seemed like I started throwing harder and harder than I did as a starter. So it really wasn't that tough of a transition for me. We had Dale Murphy on a couple weeks ago, and he said that when Joe Torrey was managing him, he knew he was going to be a great manager. Did you see the same traits in Joe Torrey when he was managing the Mets? Yeah, I did see that. He was actually, a, you know, a player manager when I was there. You know, uh, he, he really didn't play much because he was pretty much full-time manager then. But I saw that he was going to, you know, become a great manager. But when they traded me away, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I was wrong, so what can I say? And then you went and played with the Twins there. And that 87 Twins team, I mean, no one gave them a shot to win their World Series. And they just sat there and won their World Series. They had to be a thrill for you. Uh, that was the biggest thrill, you know, in my career because, uh, you know, I had, let me see, five years, six years in Montreal, and I was like one of the top closers, you know, every year in baseball. And when I went to the Twins and just looking up their history that winter, seeing their finish last, you know, I was kind of down, like, you know, going to a last place team. But as soon as I got the swing train, I remember saying to my wife, you know, after watching those guys, uh, hitting all those home runs. I mean, he had like five, six guys hit, hitting home runs every day. I said, if, you know, if we get any pitching, you know, we, we have a chance. I didn't know much about the American League, but I was very impressed with our hitters. And, you know, that's pretty much what carried us. We had a couple good pitchers, Bly Lovin, Biola, you know, myself, Close, and Baron Gear. But I'd say we won that season with four pitchers and, you know, all offense. I mean, you guys look like a softball team. You had Ken Herbeck, Kirby Puckett, Brunanski. I mean, you did not look like fit major leaguers on offense. No, no, I know. You got Gaetti, and, you know, these guys were gamers. And another thing I thought the reason we had a chance is everybody got along really well and everybody pulled for each other. It was of the seven different organizations I played for, I'd never seen a team that was so close knit together as far as hanging around with each other. And, you know, I think that's what did it uh, to make us go all the way. You don't really see that these days. Some teams, are, you know, you get some teams out there that are renting players, and uh, teams will, you know, go for a one year guy, one year deal to guys with, and then you know they don't seem to have that continuity that uh, you guys had with that team. Heck, I always no. thought. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. 
no, I agree with you. Actually, I was the only real newcomer. I mean, me and Baron Baron Gear came over, but like Lila and Viola, those guys have been on that team for like four or five years together, and they all came up together. So you're right; you don't see that too much now. If you're a bottom market team, you got a good minor league system playing together. By the time they get to arbitration, they're usually going to get traded because they don't want to pay them. You were known for your beard. When you went to the Reds at that time, they did not allow facial hair. How did they convince you to shave the beard? I mean, did they give you a choice, or did they say you're doing it? Well, a million-dollar contract pretty much uh, decided to do it. <laughs> I, you know, other teams, I, I really got uh, – Screwed that year as far as salary. I mean, to say a million dollars screwed sounds kind of stupid, but you know that year I had had thirty saves and I helped. I was with the Red Sox and helped the Braves get to the World Series, and I gave up that one home run in Game Two, and uh, you know they pretty much blamed the whole World Series on me, and that was that only made it one to one. I felt like saying I didn't lose the last three games, <laughs> so the next year I'm a free agent. And my agent at that time was talking with Atlanta, and I was willing to just take whatever they were offering, but he wanted to go free agent. Well, that home run meant so much, I guess, to other teams, which is ridiculous, that my real choices were to sign with the Reds. And it was the best offer out there. Actually, it was only 500000 the next year. Uh, and when I heard about their team policy, I didn't like it, but... I really had nowhere to go just because of that one home run, even though I broke the same record that year and was number one in uh, Major League history. I really had no other job offers. It's truly amazing. I mean, these teams just look at one game. I mean, you could come back from it. I mean, there's been a lot of pitchers throughout baseball who have given up big home runs to come back. We had a gentleman a couple weeks ago, Ralph Terry, gave up the home run in the 60 World Series of Mazeroski. In 62, he wins again. He wins the World Series again with the – or wins the World Series for the first time with the Yankees. Yeah, I'd say that was the biggest downer of my career. Uh, them, you know, pretty much putting the blame uh, of the series on my shoulders because, you know, I I got traded by the deadline and uh, I went to Atlanta. Had a one point one ERA, even though ERAs aren't that important as closer, but I didn't blow any saves. And I helped get in the playoffs. I won games in the playoffs. I saved games against Pittsburgh. And. You know, even in the series, I pitched the first game, it wasn't a save, but I pitched the second game, I gave it the home run. And next thing I know, you know, that off season, I'm, you know, I'm hearing that I'm done. I'm like, uh, I don't understand this, but, you know, that's the emphasis that is put on a big game. Is there a different mentality being a short reliever versus a closer, or do you have to think the same way? Uh, the closer's mentality is definitely different than you know any other anybody else in the pen because all the blame is going to go on that closer you know uh i mean the way they pitch now with the just the one inning uh you know i wish i could have pitched in that era too but uh i actually sit up sit back and laugh when i hear a manager say you know well couldn't bring him in the eighth inning i look at my wife and we just sort of laugh at each other <laughs> like i shit i went in the seventh inning <laughs> you know but the mentality you know it's very tough as a closer because you're getting the blame no matter what. And when you do good, they ain't going to come back to you anyway. So I always made myself available to the press when I blew a game because I knew they couldn't wait to talk to me because you don't blow that many if you're good. Jeff, but if, you're... I, if they saved the game, they didn't even want to talk to me. <laughs> Jeff, do you think we're in Chicago here, and uh, do you think that uh, a guy like Jake Peavy has the moxie to possibly be a closer? Uh, the Sox are on the hook for a lot of money to him, and uh, not so sure that he's going to make it as a starter that you can just roll out there for 70 pitches. I don't really follow him that much, but, you know, the Chicago teams, you know, I think they have a great fan base, and, you know, especially the Cubs. They just, they've never really had great closers uh, since Suter, and, you know, nowadays you definitely need that closer. So if I follow them more, I could answer your question a little better. I just I don't follow that many. You know, I follow some teams, but not Chicago down here in Florida. <laughs> I mean, you were known for that beard. What do you think of Brian Wilson, the Giants? It's a similar beard to yours. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I wore the beard because I just, I like the beard. I think he plays it up a little too much, if you ask me, uh you know, and they make a little, you know, I heard he has his own baseball cards because of his beard or something. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But, you know, uh, I always just felt like it, it makes makes you a little more intimidating on the mound. You know, they really can't see underneath that beard. And that was part of my theory anyway. 
What do you think about the a lot of uh, people have said that a lot of these pitchers now are thrown in the high 90s because they've been juiced up for years. Do you think that's the factor, or do you think it's basically the workout regimen today? I actually don't believe they're all throwing that hard. Uh, I think either the guns are inflated. This I don't know why somebody would – there'd be so many guys throwing in the high 90s. I mean, when I played, there were, you might have two guys in all Major League Baseball that threw in the high 90s. Now it's like uh, they got five guys on a team throwing high 90s. So, But maybe what you said, maybe it's a workout regimen. I know the, from talking to people I know in baseball that – you know, they take it much more seriously, but, you know, as far as working out and stuff, because the money's so high and everything, but, uh, you know, I also hear you know, they don't have as much fun as, you know, we used to. I mean, we we played it as a game. We wanted to win, just like they do, but these guys, uh, you know, are really into what they look like and all that stuff. When you were playing, was there a player that you feared that every time they stepped to play, you said, you know what, I, I'm scared, I'm afraid this guy's going to hit me again? Uh, there was a few of them. You know, one of them was uh, Pete Rose, of course. You know, I think he's getting, uh, you know, the worst screw job ever by not being in the Hall of Fame. It, it wasn't as, you know, as far as you weren't worried about him hitting a home run or anything, but you know, he was like one of the hardest guys to strike out. So his name comes up a lot. So you had to be happy when he joined the Expos later in his career. Yeah, I played with him in 85, so that was kind of nice to play with somebody like him. And, you know, that makes me feel even worse for him after play for him because I've never seen such a gamer and somebody that loved the game because he was in his 40s then. You know, this guy loved the game. And then to see what he's had to go through, you know, because he liked to put a little money on the side or whatever, <laughs> whatever the hell he did. I still don't think it's right. But do you think he guy, was? Do you think he was gambling on games when he was playing or just when he started being the player manager of the Reds? I really don't know. I don't think I don't think he was as a player myself. And as far as a manager, uh, you know, I know you're not supposed to gamble, but I know one thing: he would never have an out, have any influence on the outcome of the game because this guy did not want to lose. You know, so I mean, it, it wouldn't. In my mind, I don't think he would bet a game that he's managing to lose and not play his best players. He wasn't like that. He wanted to win all the time. With the Twins, I mean, you had Andy McPhail as a GM. He won two World Series there. We had him in Chicago for about 10 years, and he couldn't get us to the big game. I mean, did he lose it, or he just had the great talent there in Minnesota? Well, I think he had the great talent, and, you know, even though you have a GM, he's not always pulling all the punches or putting all the trades. Uh, I think with, like, him getting me over there, I think he had something to do with it, but I think also Montreal initiated the uh, you know, because they started getting rid of guys like Dawson, Carter. You know, they're getting rid of all their big guys because they didn't want to pay them. So I don't know if, uh, you know, Andy really never made any trades when I was there. I think Montreal initiated the deal, and the team came through for him. So, you know, uh, I mean, I liked Andy and all that, but I don't know how much he had to do with bringing the championship there. Did Montreal ever draw fans there, or was it a disaster from the start? Well, I thought it was pretty good because I came from, uh, I was in New York for two years, and I mean, you guys uh old there, you probably wouldn't even believe this, but Shea Stadium was like uh, where the Marlins play, 5,000 a game. So, I mean, on a weekend, we might have 10,000 people in Shea Stadium. When I went up to Montreal, you know, that first time I got there, they had like 30,000 people. I'm like, geez, this is great, you know? And the whole time I was there, we drew like uh, two, 2.3, 2.5 million. I was... Very surprised that it went downhill so much, but I think that was their fault by trading all their big guns, uh, Carter, Dawson, myself, you know, Wallach. Everyone started leaving because they didn't want to pay the players, and I think the fans got frustrated. Do you think salary cap would be good for baseball where it keep teams like Montreal, the Marlins competitive, where everybody on the same scale so you wouldn't have to worry about the Yankees and Boston buying championships? No, I, I don't think so. Salary cap is uh, good because I mean, look, look at here in Florida. You know, I always mention Marlins just because I live down there and know a lot about them. They, I mean, they got two world championships, and they definitely don't pay their players. You know, so prove that you can still win without having the highest paid players. And uh, you know, I think it should be that way. If the other team's got the money, let them 
Let them pay them if the other teams want to pay them. Thank you very much for your time, Jeff. It was a pleasure talking to you, and good luck with what you're working on right now. Okay, anytime.